we'll be listening to a marine historian talking about the abalone fisher fishing industry here in the Monterey Bay. He is going to be the recipient of the Ed Ricketts Award given by the National Marine Sanctuary folks. Also on the show will be Lisa Utal. They'll be joining us in the second half of the program. Tim Thomas is getting the Ed Ricketts Award, and um, Lisa's going to tell us how important that is and what it is, along with um, basket weaver and uh, cultural bearer Linda Yamani, who is a member of the Ohlone Rumson tribe. Uh, Tim, tell us what it is that you did to deserve this, and then Lisa can talk about the prize, the Ed Ricketts Prize. First of all, maybe you should tell us, remind us Ed, who Ed Ricketts is. Well, Ed Ricketts was a marine biologist here in Monterey, uh, made famous by John Steinbeck in the books Cammy Row, Sweet Thursday, and of course the log from the Sea of Cortez. Um, so, but your question as to why I'm getting it is, I've been wondering that same question. <laughs> so, uh, but Certainly I'm, deserved though. But I'm really honored about it, so it, it means a lot to me. Oh, uh, just tell us a little bit about the Ed Ricketts Award and, and who gets it and, and why it's bestowed on people. So we have a little oh, context. Yeah, absolutely. The Ed Ricketts Memorial Lecture, um, it's organized by uh, NOAA and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, who I work for. And the award it was created to honor scientists and uh, historians like Tim who have exhibited exemplary work throughout their career. Tim has been doing cultural and science historical stories around Monterey Bay for years. He's published many different things, and he's really advanced the knowledge of traditional ecological knowledge in Monterey Bay. And this first, the Ed Ricketts Award was first presented in March of 1986 at a conference at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So, uh, if, you know, every year our research activity panel, which is part of our Sanctuary Advisory Council group, a subgroup, they get together and they, they nominate folks. And Tim and Linda Yamani were our recipients this year for 2023. Great. And people might know the name Ed Ricketts because he was a very close friend of John Steinbeck's and was written about as a character in the book Cannery Row. He was a, a kind of a Renaissance man as well as a very good a marine biologist himself. So that that's uh, and, and of course, they sat around and and listened to classical music and ph- philosophized and drank uh, liquor and, and things like that. That's the romantic part of <laughs> of what they did. Um, Tim, are you, uh, do you relate to Ed Ricketts in some way personally? Um, hmm. Yeah, I like to think I do, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, I, 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 I understand how he was, how he operated to a certain degree, so yeah. And tell us about yourself a little. Did you grow up uh, walking through tide pools and, and wanting to know about fish people, people who fish. I, I grew up in Pacific Grove, actually, along those tide pools. Uh, I was on the, uh, I, that was my playground, actually, those tide pools, growing up as a kid. But I was always fascinated when I was growing up, uh, um, Cannery Row had been abandoned at that point, and all those old canneries were pretty much empty. And I remember we used to go through those old canneries, and I was always fascinated to what happened in those buildings. And when I, and when I was in school, it, at that time, they didn't teach us our local history. I mean, that was mandated, but uh, but then it wasn't. And so I was always fascinated. And so I reached out to try to find out what, what was going on in all those, those buildings all that time. And and many people <laughs> might know, but they might not, because Cannery Row now is kind of a tourist attraction. But yeah. um, when it was a working town, John Steinbeck wrote about this in his book, Cannery Row. But it was it was a smelly, loud, messy mm-hmm. place that employed a lot of people of different uh, backgrounds who came there to try to get ahead in, in you know, California and in the yeah. United States. Tell us about the sardine fishery. It was huge back well, in the 30s and 40s and, and well, even sardine, before. The sardine fishery in Monterey, California, was the largest fishery of a single fish in the history of the United States. All really for a fish that nobody 
ever in this time of history ever did anybody really want to eat. The money was never in the canned products. What was, was what was it in? I mean, we're making cat food out of it or what? No, actually, you know, sardine is kind of a generic word. Almost all small silvery fish were referred to as the sardine. Oh. Yeah. There was a time in the United States, really around the turn of the 20th century, into the 1920s during the Depression, people ate sardines almost on a daily basis. But the sardines they ate were those little guys that coming out of the North Atlantic, coming out of, coming from Europe. France was a big sardine producer during the 20th century. Uh, uh, of course, uh, in Monterey at that time, salmon was a big fishery in California. In Monterey, salmon was huge, uh, and it was mostly Japanese fishermen that were doing all that. And, but all that salmon they were catching, and they were catching an average of about a million pounds of king salmon in three months wow. in, in those early salmon days. All that salmon was going mostly to Europe, going mainly to Germany. Huh. And, of course, what happened in the world in 1914, World War I, cuts off all that uh, salmon going to Europe, all those sardines come up from Europe, and they just switch. You begin to heavily fish sardine along the Monterey waterfront, along the California western coast here. Uh, but it never was popular. Fish. People thought it was too big and too oily. So the real money, as I mentioned, was really in the byproducts. So next time you all go out, you have chicken for dinner, you can thank that Monterey sardine for that chicken. Wait, Barnard, it may, they turn it into chicken feed? Chicken feed. Seriously? Barnard, yeah. By 1920, the chicken industry in California was not doing very well. People did not eat chicken like we do today. It was kind of expensive began to produce this cheap chicken feed out of the head, tails, and guts of the Monterey sardine. The chickens loved it, thrived on it. More and more chickens were being produced. The price of chicken went down. People began to buy chickens. My friend Bill Ripley, who was a retired biologist, used to say the foster farm chicken owes its life to the bones of the Monterey sardine. I never knew that. That's a fascinating bit of uh, fish history, a fishy tale if there ever was one. Wow. Yeah. So they, they use the guts and the head, but did they use the fish itself, the part, the They body? did use the whole fish as well. I mean, they tried to control it. California Department of Fish and Game tried to control it, but it was just really too difficult for them to control the whole thing because uh, there's just too much money was being made. I mean, all those fish and game biologists could do, and there were a number of them here in Monterey beginning in the 20s, uh, to monitor this fishery. All those guys could do is make recommendations. Uh, all the power lied. It still really does today with the Fish and Game Commission. But in those days, it was a group of the commissioners made up of mostly businessmen, in some cases businessmen who never even seen the ocean before, were going more sympathetic to other businessmen like cannery owners who actually hired their own scientists who tell them what they wanted to hear. <laughs> wow, yeah, everything's fine. You know, um, Steinbeck had this uh, passage in Cannery Row where he talks about these boats wallowing up to the dock and yeah. disgorging rivers of silver fish like yeah. they were never going to run out yeah. but but they did it crashed what happened well crashes for a variety of reasons overfishing certainly plays a role in it uh, and they had warnings going back as early as 1929 uh, when fishing game presented at the annual sardine conference which i think is a cool thing there was a sardine conference <laughs> you imagine uh, a bunch of fish sitting in the chairs and on a podium Presented a paper showing, unless you guys slow this fishery down, it's going to collapse in about 20 years. Right. And they were and they, right. Yeah. But they had all those warnings about it, but it, it did collapse. Uh, there were also environmental issues. Uh, there were water temperature issues. Uh, at the height of this fishery, the water temperatures of Monterey Bay was warmer. And then it begins to drop after 1947, 48, and it gets colder. And the sardines don't like that cold water. And they began to make this disappearance. So they think that they, it's believed that when they began to heavily fish sardine in Monterey in 1915, they were sort of on this declining cycle, and then we kind of hastened the process. And where are they now as a fish, you know, a source of protein and as a species? Are well, they... they still fish them. In Mexico, they fish sardines, and they get big numbers. They were at least a couple of years ago, uh, like huge numbers of sardines. And it's the same fish they're getting on California coast. Uh, yeah. But the market isn't, there isn't really a big market for it. I mean, I know they fish them uh, and they're flash freezing them and shipping them to Asia, uh, going to China, to Vietnam, where they'll then can them and then they'll ship them back here. Wow. Uh, what a trip. <laughs> They've gone on a trip around the world to come back and be eaten here, but they can them over there. That's fascinating. 
I have photographs I took in the Tuskegee fish market in Tokyo of California pilchards, huh. sardines, uh, it, fre live, fresh ones that uh, <laughs> in the market in Tokyo. Wow. So interesting. Now, you also studied the abalone fishery. Um, I'm speaking yeah. with Tim Thomas, a fisheries historian from Monterey and grew up in Pacific Grove. He's the recipient of the Ed Ricketts Award along with Linda Yamane, and he's on the line with us. Um, we're talking about the history of fishing in the Monterey Bay. The abalone fishery has a really interesting history. When I was a kid, there was a super low tide. We walked out uh, into the Monterey Bay in Big Sur on Pfeiffer Beach and probably would have gotten arrested today, but we had bags and bags of abalone that we just pried off the rocks with a crowbar and, and then had a giant feast on the Big yeah. Sur beach. That's yeah, probably a thing of the past, isn't it? Yeah, you'd have to be arrested today. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. But uh, uh, yeah, the abalone fishery, um, I've been researching this story for about 15, 20 years now. Uh, and the Japanese particular story, uh, abalone to me is the most important fishery in California. Uh, it, maybe not economically, but it definitely is historically and culturally. It's very, very important. Um, and they, they've been fishing abalone for thousands of years uh, along the California coast, and in Monterey in particular. Monterey was literally the abalone capital of the world at one time. I mean, the word abalone comes from Monterey, comes from the Rumson people, the native people of Monterey. That's interesting. <laughs> I did not know that. I, yeah. I thought it was a Mexican word, abalone. Well, the word, the Rumson people had a word for the red abalone, which is the predominant abalone in, in, in Monterey, actually, it's the largest of all the abalone. And that word is alun, A-U-L-U-N, and then linguists have traced that word abalone back to that word alun that starts here in Monterey. And not only that, the <laughs> shells were valued because they're so beautiful. They were made into instruments, inlay for fancy oh, furniture, yeah. right? So the Japanese arriving in Monterey in the uh, mid-1890s, coming primarily for abalone and salmon, but abalone in particular. Um, and it was a guy by the name of Otto Saburu Noda that uh, was a Japanese immigrant who came to work for the land arm of the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Pacific Improvement Company. And they had owned about 8,000 acres of the Monterey Peninsula at that time. And he, and Noda was working as a labor contractor. And he was bringing in other Japanese workers to clear land. And he was providing food and water and, and wood for their fires. And he was uh, near the Monterey Wharf one day gathering some lumber. And he looked down into the harbor and he just saw all this abalone down there. In fact, so much abalone he actually described it in a letter as being a carpet of abalone. And nobody was doing anything with it. And the reason nobody's doing anything with it, because nobody knew. I mean, what the heck are you supposed to do with it? Unless you're preparing abalone properly, it's kind of like eating a rubber boot. The Japanese who were dealing with it for centuries knew exactly what to do with it. And so notice on writes this letter back to the government of Japan, said, hey, all this abalone here, nobody wants it. The government of Japan sends a guy by the name of Jinosuke Kodani, who was in the abalone business in the Chiba Prefecture of Japan. He comes over and he said, this is great. Not only are there a lot of abalone, these abalone are big. And he sends back to Japan for other abalone divers. Um, uh, uh, they were initial ama divers or free divers. Uh, and I'm sure many of you folks have seen photograph images and photographs and of, of ama. If you think of ama in Japan, we think of women divers which is true today, but they were men as well. And it was men Ama who came to Monterey, uh, diving in that traditional little white cotton outfit. They still dive that way, actually, in Japan, a lot of women divers do. Yeah. I was always amazed about that, Tim Thomas, because it's cold down there. And it's- the Monterey is not known for its warmth. <laughs> no, it's uh, chilling to the bone. And uh, just diving you know, that deep, you would have to brave a lot of um, things like the currents. There's quite a lot of riptides. Monterey Bay is about 15 degrees colder than it is in Japan, where these guys are coming from. Uh, so they uh, they began to helmet dive, beginning around the turn of the 20th century, uh, bringing helmet gear uh, from Japan. And, uh, and But even then it was too, too cold. So they actually, there was a dive company in Tokyo uh, that was producing this thick wool underwear that they would wear uh, uh in fact they, it was uh, uh they put that on then their clothes and it became a canvas suit 
yeah, and about 65 pounds of lead weight to the front and back. They would tie lead to their shoes and bolt on the helmet and then go down into the Monterey Bay. In the early days, they'd go down 30, 40 feet into the bay, and they were hand pumping the air to the diver at that point. Uh, and then in the 20s, they would put uh, air, they put air compressor on the boat so they could push the air down to the diver with a motor. So now he's going 50, 60, 80. In some cases, they'd go as deep as 100 feet into the bay. Now, at that level, you can't stay down there very long, so then work their way up very slowly to a 30-foot level where they could be down there all day collecting abalone. It sounds incredibly dangerous. I imagine some people died doing this trade. Actually, not as a diver. I, I you know There were accidents, but mainly because of weather conditions and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but not, they were very, Japanese were very safety conscious about how they did it and they knew what they were doing. They were good at it. And they've been doing it for hundreds of hundreds of years. How did they get the abalone over to Japan without it spoiling? I mean, it is a, a seafood, right? Yeah, they were drying it. I see. Okay. And they just like laid it out in the sun in little slices um, they, or something? Yeah, they had, you have to sort of wash it first and there's a whole process to it. And then it's laid on racks for 10 or 12 days to dry. And, and then it's shipped. Dried abalone in Japan is still today a very important product. And, and, and so they were actually canning abalone at, at Point Lobos for a while, uh, uh, but nobody in Japan wanted the canned product. They wanted the dried product. I guess they knew what they liked and didn't like. And Lisa, you're still with us. Um, there are certain regulations now about gathering abalone in the Monterey Bay. Uh, like I said, I would have been arrested, except I was only seven years old. I, I probably couldn't have been held responsible for what the adults were doing. But tell us uh, what is it and isn't allowed when it comes to abalone fishing in the well, marine sanctuary currently um while uh the the regulations of abalone have um you know collectively by the state of california and federal have come to a halt and so while there is about one two three four five six seven or so i'm counting here uh abalone that have been in california waters all of them are threatened, endangered, some nearly extinct. And so there is no take currently of abalone. The ones that I know, I used to dive 20 years ago for abalone in Northern California. We could free dive for them. It's been closed since 2018. That's very sad. So it's almost it's extinct, and it was the main food source of another endangered species, the California sea otter. Right. Like all of these sort of organisms that are endangered or nearly extinct, the science that's done on them, usually it's really about the total ecosystem. So we have to look at other things happening in the environment. Abalone has declined also, not just due to fishing, but the warming of the ocean and other um, criteria, things like the kelp forest going away because kelp is one of the main food sources for abalone. So you can see how everything's connected. If the kelp forests die off, that impacts um, the abalone populations. So we really need to take care of our oceans. Um, there was a little bit of good news today. The Otter 841 had a baby. <laughs> if anyone was following our little otter that was biting sea bo <laughs> surfboards, she was probably doing it to defend herself because uh, she was pregnant. Did you know about this? Yes, absolutely. It's, been an, it's amazing that uh, this, this otter has been incredibly adept and evasive. And it, it turns out probably that behavior, I can imagine, had a little bit to do with maybe she was pregnant. Well, I yeah, used to know. eat strange, I used to have strange cravings, so you never know. Maybe she was craving styrofoam or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. Who right. knows? But now that she's given birth, right, she's, she's going to be in the water and pretty preoccupied with hanging with her otter pup. Yes, and the, the, the pictures are absolutely adorable. Well, we have about four more minutes. Um, let's hear a little bit from both of you about what do you think the future holds? I mean, you're a historian, so you look backwards, Tim, Thomas, but um, what, do you, what should we be watching for based on your research looking back in time um, in terms of the future of these fisheries? What can be done? 
What do you think is being done? Well, again, most of my focus for these last several years has been on the abalone fisheries, and I work with uh, with some folks down in the in the central part of California who were old abalone fishermen who are trying to reestablish that fishery, at least in that part of California. And uh, honestly, I don't think that can ever happen. I think you need to learn your lesson. And uh, uh, they did take a lot of abalone uh, 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 on the California coast over those years. Um, I mean, Monterey in 1916 are bringing in 600,000 pounds of red abalone in abalone season. That is a lot of abalone. So, uh, I, uh, but there is a big push to try to revitalize that whole fishery again. Uh, but I just don't think that's going to happen again. Maybe not in our lifetime, but maybe, maybe in our children and children's and grandchildren's yeah. lifetime. Let's hope. Uh, Lisa, what, uh, what's your <laughs> prognostication for uh, um, revival? I think this is, you know, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary does ecosystem protection. We don't regulate fisheries, but I can tell you that it is a combination of all the scientists and the educators and those resource managers, protection managers that are coming together. We couldn't have better science being done to inform the fishing regulations that get set every year. We couldn't have more, um, I want to say, sustainable fisheries happening in our area. Um, you know, particularly with our local fishermen, um, there's so much work on both the private and public side working to uh, support, you know, our fisheries into the future so they'll be fish to fish. And that, you know, that's from abalone to sardines. So, and you're seeing, if you've noticed, you know, Monterey Bay has come alive in the last 10 years with so many different organisms. Um, and, and as we move into the future, as much as we can at Monterey Sanctuary educate folks about what they can do, um, I think collectively what fish is appropriate to eat. You know, the aquarium does such a great job with Seafood Watch and informing the public about what's the right fish to eat, to eat locally. So I feel like these things collectively, this ecosystem-based management that's happening through research, education, is really makes me optimistic that there's hope here in Monterey Bay Area and in California. Well, thank you. And- thank you, Lisa Utal and also Tim Thomas. Thanks for being on the program today. We really appreciate your time. And congratulations. There'll be a, a little ceremony. You want to plug that for the public? I sure would. Um, That's going to be just excellent. Um, Tim and Linda will be honored at the Sanctuary Exploration Center in Santa Cruz on Wednesday, November 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. The doors at the center will open at 5.15 for a meet and greet with Linda and Tim, and we will present the Ricketts Award to them. Really excited, and congratulations, Tim. Thank you. And I'm pretty sure that was when they were so excited that you're the recipient of this award this year. All right. Thank you both for being here. Tim Thomas, congratulations, and please send my congratulations to Linda Yamani as well. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you both. This is Talk of the Bay on K-Squid 90.7 FM. And coming up in just a moment, it'll be from the bookshelf. That'll be right after First Person Singular. I'm Rachel Ann Goodman. This is KSQD Santa Cruz, KSQT Prunedale, K-Squid, your ink spot on the dial. Support for KSQD comes from Seymour Marine Discovery Center, celebrating its redesigned space on the west side of Santa Cruz. Visitors can explore climate solutions Tuesdays to Sundays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Learn more at seymourcenter.ucsc.edu. Thank you, Seymour Center, for supporting K-Squid Community Radio.